Please, I'll make sure to record the notes from tonight so that if you ever want to go back and rewatch the video and catch up on some of the stuff that maybe you didn't quite understand or you missed the first time around, you will be able to do that whenever you are able to. So today's notes, we're going over the February 2nd notes for chemical reactions. So chemical reactions are what happens when we have two or more different substances and they come together and react together to create something new. If that sounds a little bit familiar, that might be because we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about like the physical changes and the chemical changes and stuff like that. And we talked about how in a chemical change, you start off with one set of substances, but then it gets turned into something different and something new. And the actual process by which we go from our starting material to our ending material in total is called a chemical reaction. So chemical reactions are changing substances. Again, we're starting off with an original set of atoms or molecules or compounds or mixtures or whatever it is, and we're changing those into something new or different. So one set of substances goes through some sort of chemical change in order to form new substances. So this is happening around you pretty much all day, every day, in ways that you might not have really thought about before. So common ones include things like growth. So this caterpillar down here is not gonna stay this small anymore. As it eats the leaf, it's gonna grow bigger and bigger. And then finally, it'll go through that metamorphosis and turn into a butterfly. Similar thing with you. I'm assuming you are not the same size that you were when you were a one-year-old baby. That's because us, just like a caterpillar, ate food, ate plant and fruit and meat over the course of our lives. And we changed those substances into energy, into bone cells, into muscle cells that allowed us to grow and develop into adults over time. So we're taking those food substances and changing them into energy or cells for humans. So a chemical reaction to break down that food and turn it into something usable for people. Ripening is another very common chemical reaction that you've had to deal with every single time that you've bought any sort of fresh fruit or vegetable from the grocery store. So in the case of things like avocados or bananas or tomatoes, like what's in this picture right here. It starts out as unripe and then over time changes and becomes ripe and ready to eat. And eventually, if you don't eat it fast enough, becomes overripe and kind of gross and sweet and sticky and not really that great for eating. So that changing over time, that ripening is a chemical change. The chemicals inside of that fruit are changing. It's like if you've ever eaten a kind of green banana versus a yellow banana versus like a brown mushy banana, they taste very different. And that's because the chemicals inside of the banana have changed from larger kind of blocky starch chemicals to smaller sugar chemicals. So there's less structure so it becomes more mushy and the starches get turned into sugar. So it tastes sweeter. So that's why the yellow banana tastes nice, but the brown banana where too much change has happened tastes kind of gross and mushy. But that change is happening down at the chemical level. We're changing from one set of substances and chemicals into something different. 
A very similar thing happens with decomposing. So if you leave like some bread out on your counter for a couple weeks, it's going to start to grow like mold and fungi and bacteria on it. And all of those guys are breaking down the bread and turning it into energy for themselves. Finally, a really classic chemical change that we talked about when we were first talking about it way back a couple weeks ago was burning or combustion. So in this case, we're taking wood and we're combining it with heat and oxygen in order to create smoke that's going to like come up off the fire up into the sky and ashes that are going to be left over on the ground. And the smoke and the ashes are different chemicals than the original wood, right? It's not the same substance. It's not the same thing anymore. That's how we know that it is a chemical reaction because this process is playing out, this wood is getting burned and the substances that we end up with are different than the material that we started with. So chemical reactions are all about this chemical change, this change happening down at the atom of, at the level of like the atom and the compound. So what are some signs, what are some ways that we can tell that a chemical reaction might be going on? So remember, all chemical reactions produce something new. In the case of some chemical reactions, if that thing new that they produce is a gas, then we will see bubbles appear in there. So this is what happens when you drop the Alka-Seltzer tablet into the water and it starts fizzing and bubbling. This is what happens when you mix vinegar and baking soda. When you, If you're making like the homemade volcano for the science fair, you mix those together and all of a sudden it starts spewing up and like over pouring your mixture. That's because when you made gases and the new things that are produced at the end of the chemical reaction, those gases formed as bubbles and then rose to the top of the water or the vinegar or whatever it was that you mixed it in. So these bubbles can indicate that a new gas has appeared. That would be a sign of a chemical reaction. On the opposite of that, if instead of forming a new gas, you instead form a new solid, that is also a sign of a chemical reaction. So in science, we give these new solids that are formed a fancy word. So we call them a precipitate. And a precipitate is just whenever you mix two different chemicals, usually two different things that are liquid. And then all of a sudden, this new like solid forms in your container. Sometimes it'll look kind of like crystals. Sometimes it'll look like dust. Sometimes it'll just kind of form as a lump on the bottom. But this new solid is being formed due to a chemical reaction between these two liquids. So one of the new substances that's being produced is a solid, and it'll probably fall down to the bottom of whatever container that you're putting it in. So gases or solids being formed, good signs that you have some sort of chemical reaction happening. You could get the colors to change in your substances. Now, one point of clarification here. This does not mean that when you take some purple Kool-Aid and you mix it into the water and stir it around and the water turns purple, you're like, whoa, the water was clear, but now it's purple. Must be a chemical reaction. That is not exactly what we are talking about here. The water is purple because the mixture that you put in was purple. This kind of color change would be like if you mixed two clear liquids together and then all of a sudden something blue was formed or a blue liquid started appearing. Or for a little bit more slow kind of example, if we think back to the, let's say the banana from earlier, a banana starts as green, but then over time it changes to yellow and eventually brown. 
that color is changing because of chemical reactions inside of the banana peel. So as the banana ripens, part of that chemical reaction causes the color of the banana to change. The pigments that are in the skin of the banana are being changed as it ripens over time. So that's the kind of color change that we are talking about. If you get a new color that you weren't expecting from your substance. Besides the color changing, you could also have the temperature change. So like when we light something on fire, it gets hot, right? That's part of the chemical reaction. So that's a sign that you have some sort of chemical change happening in your substance. Same thing with these little hand warmer packets. I don't know if you guys probably haven't had much experience of them if you've lived in Texas for most of your life. But when I was living in Ohio for five years in the mid 2000 teens, the sometimes in the winter time, the temperature would be like 15 or 20 degrees outside, which freaking sucks. That's super cold. That's one of the reasons I left Ohio. Too cold, not fun. When it's that cold, sometimes I would get these hand warmer packs, which if you've ever seen them before, they kind of look like the little silica gel packs that come in like new pairs of shoes and stuff like that that you throw away. These ones, you squish them together a little bit and then you stick them inside of your gloves or down into your boots. When you squish them together, the chemicals that are inside the little packets come into contact and they start going through a chemical reaction. And one big byproduct of this chemical reaction is heat is produced. So it's a nice way to help keep your fingers and toes warm, even when it's freaking freezing outside. So the temperature increases over time due to these chemical changes, which is one way that you can tell that a chemical reaction is occurring. There's also some reactions that do the opposite. They cause the substance to get colder than it used to be. Some chemical reactions, while they're going on, they produce light. So again, if you think back to our fire example, the flames that come from that combustion produce light. They allow us to see even when it is dark outside. So light is being produced as part of this chemical reaction happening. As this one set of substances gets turned into a different set, it produces light. Same thing with some animals like this jellyfish here, or probably most famously fireflies do this as well. The reason why the butts of fireflies light up at night is because there are chemicals in there, there are proteins inside the butt of the firefly, that when they break those proteins down, part of that breakdown reaction produces light. And that's what lights up the butt of the firefly and makes it glow nice and pretty in the summertime. Finally, you can also have the smell or the taste of your substance change as a result of this chemical reaction. So you probably do this all the time at your house without realizing it. When you take some meat and you slap it on the grill for a couple minutes and it gets like nice and charred and brown on the outside, that charring on the meat is due to a chemical reaction between the meat and the hot metal that you put it on. It also changes the taste of the meat and makes it taste super delicious and tasty. Same thing with the like banana or we'll say like the avocado from earlier, right? If you get a super unripe avocado, it's hard as a rock. You got to really work to scoop it out and it just kind of tastes okay. It's not really great. But if you wait for a couple days, let it become like nice and squishy so you can slice it open, take out that seed easily and smush it all down to make some guacamole. Now the avocado tastes a lot better. Same thing with the banana. A green banana tastes like a little bit starchy and chewy, whereas a yellow banana is nice and sweet. And then a overripe brown banana 
tastes really kind of gross. It's super like sticky sweet, like too much sweetness almost. And it has a really mushy kind of gross texture. That happens because of these chemical reactions. Again, the chemicals are being changed and these new chemicals, when they hit your nose or your tongue, maybe smell different or taste different than the original ones did. So you end up having this different smell or taste than what you started with. I wouldn't recommend testing this out on uh, most chemical reactions that happen in a chemistry lab, but for a lot of things like food, so with cooking or baking, a lot of that is based on chemical reactions and what happens to different types of food at different temperatures. So here in this picture, we can see we have some bubbles that are forming as this chemical reaction is going on. And I mentioned our little jellyfish friend earlier. Uh, so jellyfish and fireflies display, display what's called bioluminescence, which is basically just a fancy science word of saying, of saying light from something that is alive, right? So we see light all the time from the sun and moon and stars and the light bulbs in our house and the screen of our computer or our cell phone, but none of that is living, right? Those are not living materials. Animals like jellyfish and fireflies obviously are alive and produce their own light through these chemical reactions. And so we, that's why scientists call it bioluminescence. Bio meaning like living thing and luminescence, just a fancy way of saying it lights up. Oh, um, right. Um, any questions so far about kind of what chemical reactions are or what some of these different signs of chemical reactions mean? Yes, Mr. Michael, number two, please the this one mm -mm. so a precipitate is just a fancy science way of saying a solid forms so in some chemical reactions when you mix two liquid chemicals together a solid will start to form so sometimes it looks like crystals or sometimes it's kind of uh, dusty or chalky looking, or sometimes it's just a lump starts to appear at the bottom of your container. And so scientists call that lump a precipitate. It just means that a new solid has been formed as part of the chemical reaction. So like in number one, bubbles are appearing because a new gas has formed. And number two, a precipitate is appearing because a new solid has formed. So a precipitate is just a fancy way of saying a solid that formed during a chemical reaction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Uh, great question, Seema. Thanks for having me clarify that a little bit. Thank Anybody, you. Any other chemical reaction questions before we move on and dig into these a little bit more detail? No, sir. And actually, I'm sorry, the jellyfish one, you said when it's this one, mm -hmm. the glowing jelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a jellyfish, a type of animal that lives in the ocean and kind of floats along. And some jellyfish have special cells in their bodies that light up. And the reason why they light up is because of a chemical reaction. There are special proteins in those cells. And when the jellyfish breaks down those proteins, it gives off light as part of that breakdown process. So the bioluminescence 
is the light produced by the jellyfish cells. So it makes it have this kind of glowing look at nighttime. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. All right, so when a chemical reaction is happening, maybe the new thing being produced will be a gas or a solid. Maybe it will have a different color than your original substances. Maybe the chemical reaction will cause light or heat to be produced. Maybe the chemical reaction will cause a change in the smell of the chemicals or the taste of the chemicals. But again, this is all happening because we're going from one set of substances into something new, something different. So because it's science and because scientists like to put special words on things, there are specific ways that we define the old substances and the new substances. So chemical reaction changing from original to new. Our original substances, the ones that are going to react together as part of this reaction, are called reactants. So sometimes you'll see chemical reactions written out as kind of like an equation, like a math equation, where instead of an equal sign, it'll be a little arrow like this. So the left side of the arrow is our starting material, which is our reactants. Why are they called reactants? Because they react together. So these are the substances that are actually going to do the chemical reaction with each other. They're going to come together and cause some sort of reaction to happen. When all is said and done, after we get through doing that reaction, we are left with our new substances, which we call products. Why do we call them products? Because they are produced by the chemical reaction. So our products are over here on the right-hand side of our chemical equation. So we start off with our reactants over here. And then we say either the reactants yield or the reactants produce our products. So our products are produced at the end of the chemical reaction. They are the new substances that we are making. So reactants, original old substances, products, new substances. Reactants react together. Products are produced. So that is our two sides of the chemical reaction. We might have multiple reactants, lots of different chemicals reacting together. We might have multiple products, lots of different things being produced, but always, always, always are the reactants gonna be what we call the starting material and the products be what we call the ending material. So to kind of put this into perspective and look at what an actual chemical reaction or chemical equation looks like. We are going to look at the equation for photosynthesis. So before I actually bring it up, does anybody know what photosynthesis is or what does the photosynthesis reaction do? Isn't it what causes the plant to be green? Close. It when, is like the sun gives the energy to the plants. Yeah, that is a great explanation. So yes, Ashley, you're right. It is. It does happen in the places of plants that are green. And what happens is that the sunlight helps the plants make energy. So the food that the plants use as energy comes from the sun, hence the photo and photosynthesis. 
So plants are not like us, right? We have to eat plants or eat other animals in order to get energy. Plants are able to make their own energy through photosynthesis. So the photosynthesis equation looks a little bit like this. It's a little bit big and complex, but I'll walk you through each part. So plants take carbon dioxide, CO2, which is a gas floating in the atmosphere, and water, which is H2O, which they get from the soil and their roots. They use the energy from the sunlight and they produce glucose, which is this big C6H12O6 molecule that is a sugar. So glucose is another name for a simple sugar molecule. And they also produce oxygen at the end of this, which we will eventually use to breathe. So when you breathe out, you exhale carbon dioxide, which then the plant uses to produce sugar and oxygen, which it then releases from its leaves, and we breathe it in and produce carbon dioxide, and so on and so forth. So notice we start off with carbon dioxide and water. We end with glucose and oxygen. Different materials on either side. So we know it's a chemical reaction because these chemicals are different from these chemicals, right? They are not the same thing. We start and we end with different materials. So therefore, it is a chemical reaction. Now, thinking about what we were just talking about one slide ago, carbon dioxide and water are over here on the left hand side of our equation. So are they the reactants or the products of the photosynthesis equation? The reactants. I think the products. Ashley, you are right. Nasima, you are incorrect. These <laughs> are the reactants. So remember, reactants are what we have to start off the chemical reaction. And in photosynthesis, we start with carbon dioxide and water. Those are our starting material. Those are what are going to react together. They are on the left-hand side of our arrow. So they are the reactants. What about over here? What are these guys called on the right-hand side of the arrow? Product. Yeah, there you go. These are the products. So glucose and oxygen are produced by this reaction. They are the end products, the new substances that are produced. We don't start off with glucose and oxygen, but we do end with glucose and oxygen. So the reactants are the starting material the products are what are produced, our ending material. So that's how these chemical reactions kind of get initially set up when we want to look at, okay, what do we have going on in our reactants and what are they going to produce? The other really, really important thing that I want to pull your attention to with this equation is that chemical reactions cannot create or destroy matter. What I mean by that is they can't add in or take away any of the starting atoms that we have. So in our photosynthesis reaction, on the left-hand side in our reactants, we have some carbons from our carbon dioxide. We have some oxygens from our carbon dioxide and our water. And we have some hydrogens from our water. So we have C's, O's, and H's in our reactant side. 
What about in our product side? What are all the different types of atoms that we have in the products? We have, I think, the same, just the numbers. Uh -huh. like a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So we have C's, we have H's, and we have O's in our products. So as Nasima noticed, on both sides of our reaction, we have some carbons, we have some oxygens, and we have some hydrogens. So we have C's, O's, and H's over here. C's, O's, and H's over here. So we didn't add in or take away any of our starting atoms, right? There's not like a nitrogen or a fluorine or a lithium over here that wasn't there to begin with. So nothing got added to our reaction. Also, we didn't lose anything. We have three different atoms on our reactant side, C's, O's, and H's. And so we have to have those same three atoms on our product side, C's, O's, and H's. However, what we did do, as Nasima pointed out, is rearrange the atoms. So the numbers got adjusted a little bit. There, over here, we have C and O and H and O together. And then over here, we have a C, H, O all together, and then some O's on their own. So we didn't add or take away any different atoms. We just rearranged the atoms that we have. And that is one of the big kind of fundamental concepts of these chemical reactions is that we cannot add or destroy any of our original atoms. Any type of atom that we have in the reactant side, we also have to have in our product side. No more, no less, just the exact same types of atoms. Now we can adjust where those atoms go. We can adjust where they're bonded to, right? There are a whole bunch more different bonds going on and this glucose than these little CO2s and H2Os over here. So we've changed a lot about which atoms are bonded to what and how many atoms are bonded where, but we have the same different types of atoms overall. On Thursday, we'll actually talk some more about how exactly these numbers balance out with each other. But today, the big thing to kind of take away is that we have to have the same types of atoms on both sides. If we have O's and H's and C's on the reactant side, we have to have O's and H's and C's on the product side. We can rearrange how they're attached to each other, but we cannot change what atoms are there. Whatever we start off with, that has to be what we what is produced. We might get some new chemicals, some new substances, but they're made up of the same types of atoms that we started with. Does that make sense okay to everybody? Everybody kind of understand what's going on with our different atoms on the different sides? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, cool, cool, cool. Um, let me think. So those were our, kind of our first big takeaways from these chemical reactions. We have the reactant side that we start with. We have the product side that we end with. We have different chemicals on the reactants and product side, but they're made out of the same atoms. Glucose and oxygen are made out of the same atoms as water and carbon dioxide, just rearranged and switched around differently. So cannot destroy or create any new or different atoms. The same thing is true with energy. So all chemical reactions have some sort of energy going through them in some way. 
some release energy to the environment, some absorb energy from the environment. And we'll talk about the differences between those in a second. But it's the same idea of we cannot create or destroy energy. What we can do is change it from one form into another. So just like we can change how the atoms are attached to each other, we can also change what sort of energy is being created with our chemical reactions. As long as we have the same from the beginning to the end in total. So like in this super basic example right here, we have a light bulb that's turning on by electricity. So this light bulb is getting 100 units of electrical energy going into it. Five of those units are going to be used as energy to create the light that's produced by the light bulb when you turn it on. And 95 of those units are going to be used for heat. So if you ever put your hand near like an old school light bulb, you'll notice after it's on for a few minutes, it gets really hot and it can burn your hand if you touch it. That's because a lot of the energy that it gets from the electricity gets transformed into heat and only some of it is actually used to create light. But notice five and 95 is still 100. So we haven't lost or added in any extra energy. We've just taken the energy that we started with and changed it into some different forms. So there are all sorts of different forms that energy can come in. With our photosynthesis equation, for example, light energy is the type of energy that comes from the sun and is gonna be used by the plants in photosynthesis. And it's gonna be transformed into chemical energy. So the glucose, that sugar molecule that's produced by photosynthesis, it's a form of chemical energy. It's what the plant is going to use as its food source. However, the plant might not make it that far because it might get eaten by a person like you and me. So when we eat the plant's energy, we're gonna turn plant chemical energy into human chemical energy. So we're gonna change the form of the plant that we eat a little bit and it's gonna go through chemical reactions in our stomach and be transformed into a type of energy that is more useful for humans. Again, we're not losing any energy or getting rid of any energy in the process. We're just changing what form that energy is in. So there's light energy, there's chemical energy, there's electrical energy, like we were talking about with the light bulb. Um, also, heat energy is another big one that uh, I mentioned with the light bulb. So energy and chemical reactions is able to be transformed into different forms. It doesn't have to stay as one single type. All right. So when we talk about kind of overall ideas of energy and how it relates to chemical reactions, there's kind of two major camps of chemical reactions, two different major types that most chemical reactions fall into. Either they are an energy producing reaction or they are an energy absorbing reaction. So the first one we're gonna talk about, energy producing reactions. These guys are called exothermic reactions. They are reactions that release, exo means like going out or being released, and thermic meaning like thermal, like heat. So exothermic reactions release heat energy, release energy into the environment. 
So these guys are giving off energy. While the reaction is going on, energy is being produced and given off into the surrounding environment, the surrounding atmosphere. So generally, this causes the nearby temperatures to go up because all that energy is being absorbed by the little gas particles or water particles or whatever it is are nearby, and they start to move around faster and get hotter. So classic exothermic reactions include things like digesting food. So when we break down the food that we eat from other plants or animals, it provides us energy, not just to be able to move around and do activities, but it also helps keep our internal body temperature up. So as you're probably aware by now, judging on the number of times you probably had to have your temperature scanned during this COVID pandemic, humans have a body temperature of around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you get temperature scanned and you're in the 98 degree region somewhere, that means that you're pretty healthy. Obviously, the exterior temperature, like right now, I think it's probably like 60, 59 degrees or something outside. That is quite a bit different than the 98 degrees inside of your body. So your body likes to keep its interior nice and toasty warm. In order to keep up that energy, that heat inside your body, we need to digest a lot of food. So that's why we have to eat so often, like two or three times a day, in order to make sure that we're able to keep up our energy. Because a lot of that energy is going to be used to produce heat that keeps our body temperature at the correct level. Decomposition is another classic exothermic reaction. As things break down and are decomposed by bacteria and mold and fungi and stuff like that, that creates energy for those um, microbial organisms to use. Probably the most classic example of an exothermic reaction, though, is burning some sort of fuel. So a classic combustion reaction. Whether it's a match or some other type of wood, whether it's a candle or a propane grill or gasoline in your car, when you burn fuel, it produces a lot of energy, a lot of heat. So after you've been driving for a few minutes, even if it's a cold day outside, the hood of your car is going to be hot because all of that burning of that gasoline is heating up the engine and the interior of the front part of your car. Same thing with even something as simple as lighting a match or setting a candle. As the oxygen and the heat and the match head or the candlestick are reacting with one another, they're producing a lot of heat and light as well. So not all exothermic reactions give off light in addition to heat, but some, especially combustion reactions, do, right? When you set that, when you strike that match, when you set it on fire, the flames that are being produced as part of the reaction are giving off light. You're able to see a little bit better in a dark area due to that light. So fire is a classic exothermic reaction. It is giving off a lot of light and heat while the reaction is going on. As those logs, as that gasoline is combusting, light and heat are being produced into the environment. They're being released into the outside environment. That's why you don't have to physically touch a fire or something burning in order to feel the heat from it. You can just hold your hands close, warm them up a little bit, and you can feel the heat from the fire hitting your hands. That's because of all of this energy that's being released by the combustion of that wood. So, exothermic reactions, energy is being given off, is being released to the environment, usually causing it to heat up. On the flip side of that, we can also have situations where energy is being absorbed and taken in by the reaction. 
And we call those endothermic reactions. So exothermic was going out, endothermic is going in. And I try to remember it by the first couple letters here. N is like in, like into thermic, endothermic, into their reaction. So in an endothermic reaction, we are absorbing energy from the environment. It might be heat energy, but it could also be light or chemical or electrical energy. A lot of the times, endothermic reactions are used to build larger molecules, larger structures. They have, you need some energy in order to form a lot of chemical bonds. So those covalent bonds and those ionic bonds that I was talking about earlier, you need a little bit of energy in order for that bond to become solid. So like in photosynthesis that we were talking about earlier, that glucose molecule has six carbons and 12 hydrogens and six oxygens in it. That's a lot of chemical bonds with all those atoms that are connected together. And so we need to absorb that sunlight energy in order to build that big glucose molecule. So it could be heat energy, it could be light energy that's being absorbed and kind of transformed and being used to build these bigger structures. Sometimes if you're using a lot of heat energy, you may see a drop in temperature. So there are some chemical reactions that will actually cause the chemicals to like cool down and get cold as heat is absorbed by the reaction. Um, but you don't have to have that happen in order for it to still be an endothermic reaction. And there are most endothermic reactions don't necessarily have like a big obvious temperature drop to them. They're more so about absorbing this energy and building these large structures from it, whether that's chemical energy or heat energy or light energy that's being used or absorbing that energy and using it to produce these bigger structures. So like photosynthesis, like I was saying, Carbon dioxide and water, pretty small structures, only three atoms each. Glucose, big structure, 24 atoms in total. And so we need some energy in order for that to happen. So that's why if I jump way back here for a second, this little sunlight piece right here means that we're absorbing light from the sun. So we're absorbing that sunlight energy in order to build this big glucose molecule right here. So this chemical energy from the sugar is coming from the sunlight energy that is being absorbed by the plant. All right, so we have our exothermic reactions that are releasing energy, getting hotter, getting warmer, and our endothermic reactions that are absorbing energy. They're absorbing light or they're absorbing heat from the environment in order to fully allow the reaction to go through, usually to form a lot of big chemical bonds and make some sort of large molecule. All right, does anybody have any exothermic or endothermic reaction questions? Could you please just go back to the exo one? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yes. So remember, endothermic is going into, exothermic is going out. So the energy is being released into the environment. Most of the time, this energy release is happening as heat. So it's causing the environment around the reaction to heat up, to get warmer. So lighting things on fire, those little hand warmers that I was talking about earlier where the chemicals come together and start to warm up, that is a exothermic 
reaction, and a reaction that releases heat. Some exothermic reactions, especially combustion, like burning things, give off light, but a lot of them don't. So obviously when you're digesting food inside of your stomach, there's not like a light show happening in your intestines. When you rub that little package together for the hand warmer and stick it in your glove, that's not producing any light as part of that reaction. It's just producing the heat from the two chemicals reacting together. Okay, thank you so much. Yep, no problem. Thanks for asking. All right, so we have our chemical reactions where we're taking one set of substances and changing it into something new, something different than what we started with. Our starting material is our reactants. So those are the things that are going to react together, like the carbon dioxide and the water in our photosynthesis reaction. And then we end up with our products, our final material, our final thing that's produced as part of our reaction. So the products are produced by the end of the reaction. So that would be things like our sugar and our oxygen in photosynthesis. With our chemical reactions, remember that we cannot be adding or taking away any sort of different atoms. Whatever starting atoms we have, those have to be part of our products as well. So whatever atoms are in the reactants, like with our C's and our O's and our H's in the photosynthesis, we have to have C's and O's and H's in our products. So we can only rearrange how those atoms are bonded, how they're attached to each other. We can have there be more of them or less of them. We can take them from some compounds and put them into other compounds, but we cannot get rid of them and we cannot add anything new. Um, da -da 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 -da. Then some of our reactions are going to be exo thermic reactions that release energy and heat to the environment versus some reactions are going to be endothermic reactions that absorb energy, usually in order to build up larger structures. So like in photosynthesis, we have to build that big glucose molecule by absorbing energy from the sunlight, using the energy from the sun to sort of power that reaction and allow it to happen. All right, does anybody have any final chemical reaction, exothermic, endothermic question, signs of a chemical reaction, anything that we've talked about so far today? No, thank you. Mm -hmm. So since we just came off of working on the midterm last week, I figured I'd start you guys off with some easy to jump into assignments for today and tomorrow. So for today's assignment, Tuesday assignment, I just want you to give me a list of the six different signs that a chemical reaction is occurring. So there was that one slide where I mentioned that when we make these new substances, we might get all sorts of different signs and changes in our material. And so I want you to write in those six signs of a chemical reaction right here. And I know that I posted the notes for today a little bit late. So if you did this assignment already, but realized while we were going through the notes that you messed up on a couple of the numbers, you can definitely go back and update your answers with new answers that you think work better. That's totally fine. I probably won't get around to grading this until Thursday or Friday. So if you did this earlier, but you want to go back and change some answers, totally free to do so. And then for the assignment that'll be going up Wednesday based on today's notes, all I want you to do really is talk a little bit more, or I should say put in your own words, 
some comparisons of exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions. So I essentially want you to tell me what makes a reaction exothermic and what makes a reaction endothermic. All right, and like I said, that'll be the Wednesday assignment. So make sure that you hop on to the Google Classroom tomorrow and fill that out to get your Wednesday attendance. All right, does anybody have any final questions about the chemical reactions notes from tonight or the daily assignments for today and tomorrow? No. No. Thank you. Yeah.